So it's a pleasure to me to present Giovanni Bellettini. He's a member from the CTP. And he will talk about apparent contours and reconstruction of solid shapes. Thanks a lot. So thank you. Uh, so the, the talk of today will be on this, uh, on this argument, apparent contours. I will, do, uh, I will try to be as uh, simple as possible. I will explain the motivations for this work, which came from uh, calculus of variations, actually. Uh, but uh, almost immediately, the problem uh, became uh, a problem in, uh, in topology. So I will try to explain in, in which sense this, this is the case. So uh, all the details uh, uh, will be uh, are written in this book uh, uh, a couple, uh, three years ago, it was published uh, by Springer with uh, uh, three co-authors of mine, three colleagues. Okay, so let me, let me explain the initial motivation. The motivation is a motivation from applied mathematics, if you want, uh, or also from um, how, how the human brain tried to reconstruct uh, a shape, a three-dimensional solid object, starting from a draw on the plane. So for instance, here, in this plane, you see in this plane, there is a cusp, the presence of a cusp here. And this cusp comes as a projection locally of, of this uh, fold, of this surface here, in uh, b-dimensional surface in three dimensions. Also this here, another projection so the problem is, uh, if I draw a sort of graph in one plane, suitable plane, uh, why the human brain reconstruct almost immediately and very often uh, a three-dimensional, uniquely essentially, a three-dimensional solid object? Why is it the case and uh, wh what's happening? So uh, I, I will uh, focus on, on the projection of a contour say, o on a graph in the plane, and then I will try to reconstruct the solid object, the, sh the scene. It is called the three-dimensional scene. Uh, possible applications, uh, as usually in, in reconstruction of images, uh, come from uh, images from satellites or medical images, computer vision, image segmentation, and so on. I am not, at, at the moment, I will not discuss really these applications. Uh, this is a talk uh, uh, focused on mathematics. One of the motivations that we had uh, is, uh, for, uh, is the following interesting example. So you have this, uh, this two-dimensional draw. And uh, how is it possible that uh, most of us, depending also on, the, on, the, on how far we are from this picture, but most of us are sort of reconstructing uh, some triangle here, which is, uh, which is not there, but it is, uh, in some sense, we, 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 our brain automatically imagine a triangle here. So, and, and the problem is still open here. Try to find a, a, a variational model, some energy to minimize, uh, which uh, is capable to to reconstruct uh, in the minimizer of which could be, say, something which contains this triangle. Uh, this is a quite difficult problem in calculus operation, I have to say. This is, uh, uh, these are one of the many examples of Kanitza uh, several years ago. Uh, Concerning this kind of problems, uh, uh, our starting point uh, uh, were a, an article by Nitzberg and David Manford in the 90, and almost uh, immediately three years later, uh, it appeared a book uh, on this, uh, a book on computer science. Uh, the, the, and and uh, again, uh, you have given a gre given gray level, like uh, this is a this this is a gray level. You can imagine a function which is say one here and corresponding to the black part or to the gray part and zero 
corresponding to the white part. In any case, you have given this Gris level, and uh, you want to, to find an action functional, an energy to minimize, uh, to be minimized, uh, an energy defined on some sort of plane curves, uh, uh, and uh, the minimizer of which should be uh, the, the, correct the correct object that you imagine to, your brain is, is, is imagining. This is very vague, of course, because I don't want to, to even to introduce the energy. I want to go to geometry. So this is, this is just, again, a motivation for me. Uh, so suppose that you have defined this energy functional. This de must depend on the order between the objects in the three-dimensional scene. For instance, uh, in this case, we are imagining, say, a, a white triangle in front of three disks, just in front of three disks. So there should be in the, in the functional something which depends on, on the order of, in some way, on the order of the three-dimensional objects. And the minimal uh, a minimizer should carry a, a, a depth information on the order, saying which is the object in front and which is in back. Sorry, John, I don't really understand the problem, actually. What is, you, you I want to, so suppose that I give you this. Yes. I would like to find uh, an energy function defined on curves, set of curves, graphs, or something like that, uh -huh. the minimizer of which should contain, for instance, this, the, the, the boundary of this triangle. And the minimizer says, OK, on on, on exactly on this picture on this picture, saying that, OK, a minimizer could be, a, 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 the boundary of the minimizer could be a triangle. And there is also depth information, which says that this triangle is in front of three disks. OK? This is the aim, uh, one of the aims uh, of this kind of, 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 uh, of, uh, of papers of, of, of lit mathematical literatures. Sorry. Um, so, uh, no, it's it's uh, it's skipping. It's skipping uh, the next slide. No. Uh, Maybe it's the one after. Check if there's not the order. No, no. Uh, uh, oh, I didn't check this. Oh, there is an action. OK. Uh, let me see. No, it's OK. Let's go on from here. Um, so uh, the minimal configuration is, is, is carrying probably a depth order. But the, the, these kind of models have a limitation, in various limitations, because the problem is quite, is quite intricate, I have to say. Uh, they, they, this, is a very, this is a very interesting model, but still there are some limitations. One of them is that this model enforces a global ordering on the various objects. So you cannot, uh, for instance, you cannot uh, um, uh, model or get in, into, into, into your minimizer, you cannot get an object which is in front partially to another object, but at the same time in another region is behind the object. So this is a situation which is excluded by the, uh, the previous model. Again, also, one connected object, which is partially, I mean, this is a, an object which self-overlap, in some sense. Again, this, this kind of, of, of three-dimensional solid set cannot be obtained as a minimizer of such kind of model. So in the effort of uh, trying to solve and try to include these as possible minimizers, we modified, we tried to modify the energy functional into another energy functional, uh, which in particular is defined on possibly overlapping regions, uh, take into account self-occlusions. Okay, so self-occlusions now in, the, in, the, in a new model, a more refined, if you want, model can be considered. Now, it turns out, after some variational analysis, that this new energy is defined on what we will call apparent contours. I will define what it is an apparent contour. Again, we are in the motivation here. Eh? So 
no, no, uh, any, any, no details. So this was a motivation for our study on apparent contours. Okay, so the, the motivation was trying to uh, avoid the problem of self-overlapping in the manford nitzberg model. Then we, ca we come out with a model defined on graphs, suitable graphs which are apparent contours, and minimization of this function uh, also can, can, uh, can carry information on uh, how to reconstruct hidden contours and how to, which is the, the object behind and which is the ob object in front of. This is an action that I don't want to write here, is an action depending on several things, uh, on the order, on some uh, labeling, uh, on the length and curvature of the graph and so on. Uh, I, but this is, is, is technical and I don't want to enter into the details. Okay, just an example. Suppose that your grid level is this one in the sense that you, you know that your grid level is jumping on this curve, this sort of ellipse and this part here. So presumably uh, the Nitzberg and Manford model produces under certain assumption on the, on the constants inside the model, produces such a minimizer. What is this, what is this minimizer? It's just, if you want, a solid ellipsoid in front of another solid object. This is uh, not connected C. You have two objects, just one in front of the other. Okay? But there is another possibility which cannot be obtained probably with the, with the manford nitzberg model, which is this one. And this one is a connected, just one solid object, which is a connected set, which is just, uh, the, the, this is the uh, so-called apparent contour of a mushroom. Okay? Now you see here there are some uh, integer numbers. I will explain uh, the meaning of this integer number, these integer numbers in, in a moment. So this is just to say that uh, if you have this object, you want to imagine where does it come, which is the three-dimensional uh, set, uh, the, the, the draw, or the two-dimensional draw of which is this, there could be this possibility, but also this one. And these two possibilities are, can be captured by the new model, while uh, the, 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 the first model here cannot capture this second, uh, this second uh, reconstruction. So this is all about uh, trying to have a computer to recognize images? Right? Yes, so of course, computer. of course. So do you, also, do you also keep in mind how, you know, to compare this with what we would recognize when we looked at that, what humans would, would see? Uh, what do you mean to recognize, uh, to compare? I mean, do you, for example, I think we would all interpret the top one as the bottom, the bottom one rather than the middle one. Yeah, right. you, you would interpret it, do you prefer this? I don't know, I would, yes. I don't know. Uh, I would uh, <laughs> no. think that it is one. It is a mushroom. Yeah. Well, that's not even part of the question. Ah, this, no, it is very difficult to say what it is natural here and what it is not natural. What I just can say is that I'm just enlarging the possible minimizers. That's it. And probably the, the answer to this question is sort of psychological and biological problem. Neuro, neuro, neurophysiological problem. Which <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for instance. <laughs> okay, so now uh, this is just uh, just a motivation, so a short introduction. So let me go on. So let me define something now. So I have uh, suppose that I give you a, a, a three-dimensional object, this potato here. Okay, I call this E always in the in the in the seminar, and the sigma is the topological boundary of E. Is a solid uh, is a solid set. The boundary is a smooth object. Is a smooth surface. Okay, uh, then I project it, uh, I, I choose a, the projection direction. I, I, I put my eye here in the direction of minus infinity orthogonal to this plane. This is the so-called retinal plane. It is the plane when I project uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this solid object. And what I see in the projection, uh, the apparent contour that I will define for you uh, is this uh, curve, in this case it's just one curve, 
uh, on this plane, and on this projection plane, and is obtained uh, uh, directly from this solid shape in a, in a specific way, I will explain. Um, notice uh, that uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, kind of curve here is singular because you have here a transversal crossing here, and then you have two cusps here, okay? So cusps and crossings are very important in this discussion. So let me uh, try now to define what is the uh, apparent contour. So suppose that you have given a three-dimensional smooth solid shape. This is connected, but in general we can allow also non-connected objects. Okay, suppose, uh, imagine, uh, uh, imagine this object to be transparent for a moment. So this is the same object, but semi-transparent, if you want, just semi-transparent. And then uh, uh, I define what is this graph, which is called the apparent contour of this. So what is it? So you have to, to do the following. You take all points on the surface in three dimensions. So th this is, the, this is a, a boundary, a boundary of solid set. Uh, this boundary has, there are points on this boundary containing the uh, direction of projection. Okay, the projection is, is in this direction, okay, and all points uh, of the surface such that the tangent plane at that point contains this direction uh, make a curve, a smooth curve on the surface itself. Okay, for instance, uh, it is clear that at this point, the tangent plane is this, and this tangent plane contains the direction of projection. But this is not only the case for this part, uh, as you see, but there are other points having this property. Okay, so this, uh, this point uh, uh, gives you a smooth curve on the surface. Okay, now you project orthogonally this smooth curve on the surface, which is a very smooth curve without self-intersection. It's a perfect curve on the smooth surface. You project it on the retinal plane. So you take a, a projection on a plane of this uh, uh, space curve. And when you project it, then you get singularities. Okay? And which kind of singularities you get? In this specific case, you get, uh, uh, again, this corresponds to a transversal crossing and these are, this corresponds to a cusp, another cusp, another cusp, another cusp, and this is what you obtain. It is a complete graph having kind of singularities. In particular, it has cusps and transversal crossings. Okay? Now, uh, it is interesting, uh, this, this picture to, uh, th th shows an interesting fact. This, this graph uh, consists of two parts. There is one bold part, and there is another part which is not bold. This one, this one, and this uh, half circle here is not bold. What does it mean, bold and not bold? Well, the bold part is the visible part. And the non-bold part is the part which is non-visible in the sense that, uh, you see, you cannot see if this is semi-transparent. But if it is not semi-transparent, you don't see this part because it's behind a fold of the surface. Okay, so this graph essentially is divided into two. There is a visible part and, say, an invisible part. Okay? Hmm? Uh, singularities of the, of the visible part are T-junctions like this. So there is a T-junction. So th this terminates here and is occluded by this. And there is a terminal point here and a terminal point. These are singularities of the bold part of the graph. On the other hand, the singularities of the complete graph are just uh, transversal crossings and cusps. OK? OK, now uh, I, I need to, to assign to this, uh, uh, to this uh, graph some label. Because giving a graph only is not enough to reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. So now I want to endow the graph with some label, in particular integer numbers. 
Who, who, uh, what, what is the meaning of this number here, 0, 2, and 4? We have a 0, 2, and 4, and 4. These are um, even numbers, non-negative even number, integral non-negative even numbers assigned to each region of the graph, or each con a connected component uh, of, the, of the plane minus the graph itself. Okay? So this 0, this 2, is simply what? It's simply the number of, uh, the total number of uh, uh, faults that a light ray meet starting from the trajection plane. So for instance, if I take a light, a, 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 a light ray corresponding to this point, I intersect the surface twice in the direction, in the direction of the projection. OK? So you see, here you intersect four times. You have four times, four inter total intersection of all your light ray, two, four, two, zero. Zero is the external region. There are no intersections. OK? So this is just, uh, this, this is a number, a, a labeling is, is quite evident. It's, it's a very uh, easy uh, labeling. And notice that the orientation of my graph, now I, I consider a graph oriented in which sense? In the sense that on the left, locally, I have the highest number. Hmm? On the left, I have 2 and 0. Here on the left, I have 4 and 2, etc. And notice that these are always, e always even numbers. Okay. Where f, the, I call this f. f depends on sigma. Sigma is the boundary of the solid shape. I call it f uh, is a natural even number. And actually, where f is 0, this is called the background. Uh, uh, actually, this number here can be recovered simply by the, as, a, as a winding number. So it's not really something too deep. It is just twice the total winding number of a point with respect uh, of the, of the uh, you fix a point, you look at the winding number of the curve, and you, you, you multiply by 2, and you recover this labeling here. So this is f. But what it is more important in order to uniquely reconstruct the three-dimensional shape is another number. So this f is assigned to regions. Now I assign another number, d, to arcs. Arcs. Now, what is uh, this D? So here, 2, 0, and 4 is the old F. Okay? So now I give you another information. It's, the, it's number D. So D is now assigned to this arc, and to this arc, to this, to this, and to this. Okay? What is this D? Okay, D is the following. In, in words, D is the number of faults so you take a point uh, on this arc, OK? This point comes from a unique point on the surface, because this is a projection of a critical curve on the surface, as we, as we told before, OK? Now you look at the, nu at the number of folds. You, you start from the point on the surface, and you look at the number of folds of the surface that you meet, a light ray meet, before arriving to this x, to this, to this point here on the, on the curve. So it is, it is the number of faults of the surface anterior in front of the point here. So let me explain uh, in, in, with, the, with this example. d equals 0, here you have no, f no, no this is the visible part. You don't have here any, any uh, fold of the surface in front of this point. Now you take, for instance, a point here on this arc, this uh, thin arc here. So this is a point uh, essentially here. So this point uh, is the projection of a unique point on this surface here. How many uh, f uh, piece of surface are in front of this point when you, you start a light ray? You just have one. Just this part in front is just one layer, and then there is the point. So here, this is one. If I go here, now I have two, two, two layers, two layers, two folds of the surface in front. So d is two. And then it jumps to zero here. OK? This is really what matters. Uh, f is not so important, but d is extremely important. 
No, but this is a good question. Everything here in this seminar is under an assumption of stability, say genericity. This stability is a delicate and fundamental issue in singularity theory. I don't want to enter this, but exactly one of the conclusion is that you don't have any kind of uh, flat part in the, in the uh, projection direction. They are not totally independent. Now I will. No, they are not totally independent. Let me go on, and I, I will. I think I hope I will answer immediately to your question. So is this clear? So what? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, look at the point here. I want to define the number d associated to this point, to this arc. Actually, it is constant on this arc. This number. So I have this point here. This point here is the projection of a unique point on, the, on your manifold sitting on a curve. And uh, the tangent plane, uh, the, this curve is defined as the uh, points of the surface where the tangent plane contains the, the, the projection direction. So, okay? so this point is coming from a point here. Now I imagine a light ray starting from here and going to here. How many folds of the surface I am meeting before going to this? This one. And this is one. This is the number d. Okay? This is the definition. Okay? As I said, f is not so important. Suppose that I give you a set of curves and I give you only f. f must be a, a, an even number. This is the background, so 0 necessarily. Then I have to jump always by 2, 2 and 4, for instance. But then, this uh, cannot identify the topology of this object in three dimensions. Because this could be, if you want, uh, a large sphere behind and a small f uh, sphere in front, or a large sphere in front and a small sphere behind, or a small sphere inside a large sphere. So the number f is not enough. But now, if I give you a labeling D, let me call D labeling from now on. F is not so important, but D is more important in this, in this seminar. Could be connected, could not be. Yes, if I give you D and F compatible, ah. I will reconstruct uniquely the topology. And therefore, I can tell you. Not the no, no, not, ju not just from here. From here, from here, no, but from here, yes. Okay. Okay. So let me give you now not only f, but also d. OK, now I give you d as follows. For instance, f is this, 2, 4, and 0 as before. OK, this is f. But d, this is 0 here, because necessarily this must be visible. So 0, 0, also on this. But suppose that I give you here d equal 2, for instance. So what does it mean, d equal to? Well, this means simply that the small sphere is behind the large sphere. If d is 0, then this means simply that the small sphere is in front. And if d is 1, it means that there is a hole. It's a small sphere inside the big sphere. Okay? So this is a suggestion that say maybe if I find a sufficient number of conditions, compatible conditions within the f and d, then maybe I'm able to say that Always, this comes from some three-dimensional. This is one inverse. I have not understood. So, so this, this situation here, if I look from the top, let's say, yes, it can be related to a donut-like uh, shape. Donut. Donut. No, this cannot be a donut. No. This cannot be a donut because a donut has a hole here, and therefore that is visible part. So this is zero. This cannot be four. This could be zero here. Okay. Oh, let me see. I try to go to explain uh, the, to the one of the question is the following. Locally, essentially, this is one one of the pictures that happens at one singular point. So at the transversal crossing locally, we have this kind of situation. There is d which is not jumping here, but this other d is jumping from d2 to d2 plus 2. Here d1 is constant. And you have that f 
as always this structure. The minimum value is, say, here. This is the maximum value, f plus 4, f plus 2, f plus 2. You have to imagine this sort of local three-dimensional object. The orientation, you see, is such that the, the highest number of intersection with the light ray is on the left, like here and here. Okay, And this is, you see that here d is not jumping, but he, d is jumping here. Because when you, you go in this direction, there is, there is a couple of folds in front of the, of the, of the continuation of this arc. Okay? So you see d2 at the transversal crossing uh, jumps of two units. And there is, uh, there is a constant here. Oh, sorry. There is a constant, which is this. This kind of inequality. This is fundamental. Okay? So locally, uh, the situation is uh, at a singular point uh, of transversal cross type is this. Uh, we imagine it is this. And uh, what happens at the cusp? At the cusp, you see, again, uh, in this picture, we have uh, this, this constraint here, f, f plus 2. When I am here, f, then when I'm here inside, local inside the cusp, I have f plus 2. And then uh, if I have this orientation, I could have also d plus 1 here and d. But uh, this is just an example. You see from this, this is visible. So d equals 0, and here d equals 1. So it jumps of one unit at another singular point at, at the cusp. OK, this is sort of uh, what we imagine to be true when we have a, when we have a, a three-dimensional picture of a surface embedded in R3. We, we always uh, come to this kind of uh, compatibility conditions within D and F. The point is, are these enough? Are these sufficient? Uh, notice that, uh, uh, indeed, in the second uh, action function I, 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 not in, I introduced, but just discussed a little bit, uh, if I define my action function on this kind of graphs with labeling, it turns out that uh, these three objects, which are the, the datum of the problem, I can, I can put on this object a compatible labeling. You see? And the, the possibility of putting here a compatible D and F on this uh, uh, configuration with the triangle uh, is, is uh, one indication that if we are able to set the parameters so that this becomes a minimizer, then we end up really with a triangle in front of the circles. Okay? So uh, in the second action functional, the action functional is defined on this kind of graphs. So it's a complicated uh, domain. The, uh, the function has a complicated domain because it is the domain are graphs with labelings and, and, and also some, something else. Okay. Now, coming to your question, Stefano, is the, is the following. A uh, notion of stability is required everywhere here. This is, uh, this is a, um, a fundamental point in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, singularity theory. So the, for me, uh, the reference book, uh, I am not an expert in singularity theory, but I know a little bit about this book. And uh, there, there is everything. Oh, sorry, this is mappings. Mappings is a mistake. Um, everything I, I, I need, uh, we need to, to write the book uh, was contained essentially in this, in this book here. Uh, but as, as a byproduct of this kind of uh, stability assumption that we will make and genericity of projection, stability of shapes, and so on, uh, it turns out that these uh, graphs, apparent contours, the singularity are just exactly of this, only of these two types, uh, crossing, transversal crossing and cusps in finite number, and uh, t-junctions and terminal points, and no more than that. This is a consequence of these stability assumptions. Okay. Now, uh, questions are the following. If I give you a plane graph with cross crossing and cusps, uh, is it the apparent contour of a, of a 3D shape? So if I, if, I, if I give you a plane graph with a mm, compatible labeling, say. Or another question, when? You have, you have systematically analyzed all the possible compatible labels. It turns out that what I, I those, two. those two are essentially the only uh, compatibility conditions you need 
to solve this problem here. So they are sufficient, OK? Necessary and sufficient. Um, and then th this is concerns the complete graph. But if I want to, because in my picture, concretely, I don't have a complete graph. I just see the visible part of the graph. So the final aim would be, I give you only the visible part. Then from the visible part, is there a way to construct a complete apparent contour? If it is the case, after that, can we construct a three-dimensional shape coming from this complete graph? OK, this is what we are do doing here. On what? No, uh, I think that uh, I think that this is a good question. Maybe it's related to this second point. If you give you just only visible part, uh, yes, there will be essentially no. no uh, there will be at least one way to produce a complete graph. Uh, not not finite, not finitely many. Okay. OK, now, so these are questions concerning graphs, just graph. Uh, then there are more difficult questions. Suppose that you give you two apparent contours, very complicated, I don't know, 200 cusps or 300 crossings. <laughs> Can I say that these are coming from the same object? They, they reproduce the equivalent 3D shapes. This is the same question that, that appears in knot theory. And even there is extremely difficult. OK, so this is a situation much more general than knot theory. So it is even more difficult. Uh, in the class, so equivalent meaning now that they are isotopic. Maybe I will define it, what, what it means, uh, ambient isotopic, later. Uh, in the class of equivalent shapes, uh, is there one which is the simplest one? Uh, and. Uh, is it possible to automatize this issue on a computer program? Maybe this is the most interesting part of, of, uh, of the book. I have a question related to, to this, this, this point about eliminating two, two, two sets of, of data. I mean, are there simple moves that you can make? Yes, 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 yes. I'm going very slowly, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, let's see uh, examples, just to understand. Uh, Suppose that I give you this. This is just f. There is no d. But it turns out, you can check, it is not possible to put a compatible d here. So this cannot, a posteriori, cannot be apparent contour or a three-dimensional shape. But if you slightly modify it, this, with the same f, OK, there is another region here, 0. This, actually, you can, you can prove it's easy. It's easy that you can, you can, you can put a d here. And once you can put a D, there is a hope that this is coming from a three-dimensional object. Actually, it's true. So this is impossible. This is impossible, again. There is no D, but here there is D. So it's not so, OK, one, one should try by himself to find a D. Mascherina di di Carnevale. I don't know how to explain this in English. Uh, it is, is, mask. is a mask. This is, this is a mask. <laughs> this is coming from a mask. Uh, this, is, this, is, this is impossible. OK. OK, there is a first theorem, finally. Uh, the theorem says that if, you, if I give you a, an oriented plane graph with cusps and crossings, and I give you a labeling uh, satisfying the compatibility conditions that I showed before, just only those, eh, then there exists a smooth three-dimensional shape E such that uh, the apparent contour of the boundary of the shape is your G. Okay, and the D you, you get from the 3D shape is exactly your D you have given a, a priori. So this is a, a, an inverse problem. I give you a graph. I reconstruct the topology of a 3D shape. Okay. Uh, we found uh, some related reference. I think this is a sort of uh, bibliography in, in computer vision, maybe. Uh, this kind of reference related to this problem here. What about uniqueness? So there is, it is possible to reconstruct a T3 shape. Is it unique? Yes, in some sense. It is unique uh, up to transformation in the direction of the eye along each point uh, monotonically. So you don't change the, the, the fibers. I mean, you have given any x, you have a transformation which is strictly increasing in this direction and moving continuously with respect to x. Okay. It is clear that you have a sphere, but you can modify the sphere like this. 
and you don't change the apparent contour. So this is the only thing that you can do, essentially. So this is a uniqueness result, OK? OK, the proof of this is, uh, is, uh, is a proof of based on the cut and paste, essentially. Uh, if you want to go into details, in this proof is not so easy. Maybe for a geometry, it's almost trivial, probably. Uh, for me, it's not. And, uh, and, um, and working in the details, uh, it's not so, so immediate. Um, la let me mention that uh, what we reconstruct uh, is not the roundest, more natural in some sense, which I'm not able to define. It is just the, uh, a, a, an object, okay? It's essentially unique. But the most round is another problem, okay? And uh, once we have reconstructed it uh, to see what it is really, is it a torus? It is, it is a torus inside another torus. It is uh, two tori like this with the sphere inside. This is, can be very difficult in general. Okay. Um, we have a, th there is now a, a program uh, which is uh, free, which can be downloaded, the apparent app contour, it's called the app contour, this program, uh, which reconstructs the topological structure automatically of this three dimensional shape and the number of connected components of the boundary and the uh, Poincare characteristic of each of connected component. Uh, and also information distinguishing uh, between these kind of cases here. How does it scale with the number of cousins? The program? Yeah. Uh, the, the, you mean the, the oh, I think it's, uh, eh? I think it, uh, this kind of program uh, in the number of, uh, of crossings. How long you play, uh, how complicated? No, no, this is very, this is very quick. If you do this in a few seconds, you get it, the result. It's, it's not, uh, but we have not checked this with 10, uh, with 100 uh, vertices. Also because giving, giving to a, a computer the structure of a graph is not so easy because uh, no, you have to, now, now I tell you, uh, it, uh, giving as input your graph is a kind of piece of information which is not easy to give to a computer. So proving with 100 of nodes, uh, I, I don't know <laughs> exactly. So, uh, okay, then, then there is a byproduct. So suppose that I give you your graph and the labeling consistent, compatible. Now, uh, suppose that uh, from, from this theorem, uh, there, is a, there is a unique, uh, essentially, essentially unique uh, three-dimensional shape uh, having this as an apparent contour. Then it turns out that uh, the Euler characteristic of uh, the boundary of the shape can be computed just from the apparent contour. So I give you the apparent contour, and uh, uh, from that you, you, it is possible to deduce exactly the Euler characteristic, only from that. In particular, in a special case when this surface is uh, connected, uh, then it is possible to deduce also the Euler characteristic of the solid set bounded by the surface and on the complement of the set bounded by the surface. All this can be found in this program up contour. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, yes. We always look inside the stable uh, and uh, generic surfaces, so there cannot be flat, uh, so kind of strictly increasing uh, monotonic, uh, yes, strictly increasing must be at any point. Okay, uh, to show the, the difficulty of this kind of uh, problems, let me tell you, um, again, this, let me make you this observation. Suppose that E0 is a knotted solid torus like this. Suppose that E1 is a standard solid torus. Suppose that E2 is an anti-torus. So it's just a sphere, then you remove two disks and you, you do a gallery inside, inside the sphere, a knotted gallery like this. So these are three solid uh, uh, objects. Uh, it turns out that they have the same, the, the surface of these have the same Euler characteristic. It turns out that also the interior and the exterior have the same Euler characteristic, but they are not equivalent. 
So uh, in, this, is, this is an example that shows that, of course, uh, uh, knowing the Euler characteristic is not enough. Even if you know the Euler characteristic of the interface of the inside and of the outside. So this uh, says that, of course, you have to know to inspect a lot of invariance uh, of this kind of objects, uh, invariance in some sense, like in knot theory, essentially. So other invariants uh, of the apparent contour and more interesting of the 3D shape uh, can be considered. Some of them can are automatically uh, obtained by the up contour program. For instance, uh, the fundamental group of the complement of, of the solid of the complement of the set, uh, but also the fundamental group of the inside and the fundamental group uh, of the surface itself. So. Uh, Another remark is the following, how to recognize the shape, how to say that this is a sphere when you have uh, an apparent contour tremendously complicated, it turns out to be a sphere. What do you do? Well, again, as in knot theory, there, there should be some way to simplify it, uh, maybe, and, and to find a sort of elementary class of elementary moves uh, that modify locally the graph and simplify it. It's, it's sitting inside the equivalence uh, isotopy equivalence of the 3D shapes. I will explain a little bit about these moves, and this is uh, maybe one of the most important features of this program, because applying these moves uh, uh, is not at all trivial. Uh, this, now, the software code is devised in such a way to be insensitive to the particular embedded of the apparent contour in the plane, and as, uh, as I was saying, uh, it is the designed in order to capture only orientation, relative position, adjacency, and topological structure of the apparent contour. You can always modify the apparent contour with an isotopy of the plane, of, with a different morphism, if you want. But this should not be important from the, for the program. So, okay. Now, what about the completion problem? Uh, let us try again. Now, now I, let me focus on the visible part only of the graph, I want to understand maybe a, cl a, a, a class of sufficient uh, uh, conditions on the, on the structure of this object in order to be visible part of some apparent contour, okay? For instance, we realize that this cannot be visible part of anything because this singular point, terminal point, cannot, be, uh, cannot, be, cannot terminate in, in the background. This is impossible. Also, this is impossible because it is impossible that uh, uh, this, to have a visible uh, part uh, which has the background on the left with this orientation. This is, again, impossible. It, one also realized that the, the emerging arc here, this is, let me call this the emerging arc, uh, must always lie on the right of the occluding arc. So this is uh, allowed, but this is impossible, at least at the first sight. And the theorem says that if I give you an oriented plane graph with T junctions and terminal points only as singular points, so no cusps, no crossings, but only T junctions and terminal points, and suppose that the previous condition are not are satisfied, suppose that uh, we do not fall in the example of the previous sites, then this is visible contour of something, in the sense that there exists a labeled apparent contour G, which complete it in some way, in such a way that the K, given K, is the visible part of G. Okay? So, uh, philosophically, we have, the, we, we have the following. We start with only a visible part. Through this theorem, we reconstruct at least one complete apparent contour with a consistent labeling. After we have this, we can reconstruct a three-dimensional shape. So is this a generic hypothesis? I mean, we always take a 3D shape and so that, and wiggle it a little bit so that I never get any cusps? This is exactly, I mean, this, this, uh, um, this kind of uh, properties are exactly sufficient and uh, so necessary. I, I meant, I mean, I meant if I have a 3D shape and I'm Yes, you see, you, you, you see, you realize that this is impossible, this is impossible, and the other, these are only the only possible cases. Yeah. That's it. And this is a characterization. This is the other way around. What I'm saying is the other way around. Oh, I see. Okay. Ah, 
I'm saying the other way around. Okay? So in some sense, we have solved the problem in computer vision in the sense that uh, I, I can tell you, in some sense, when what I see on a, on a two-dimensional uh, picture, when this object is a visible part of an apparent contour which is coming from a three-dimensional shape. So I'm reconstructing a three-dimensional shape just only from the knowledge of part of the contour of the plane on the plane contour. So what else is there possible we have besides T junctions and terminal points in principle? No, the, the, the visible part, any, and graph is always like a any visible, visible part, part, part always like that. Right. This is due to genericity and stability assumptions. Okay. The, pro the proof of this theorem, this uh, completion theorem, is constructive. And again, uh, there is a part of the program which is called visible contour, which do this, uh, which does this. Uh, and uh, the, the proof is based on Morse's description of the graphs. I don't want to enter this, uh, this direction, but uh, the, the Morse description of this object is fundamental in, in, every, in every description. I mean, uh, now, remark, this is an important remark. When you, when you do this proof, you have, you have to prove this in any case. So you don't have a specific graph. You have any graph, and you have to prove you can do, you can do a completion with a compatible labeling. This is a global problem, because you do this locally. Any t-junction becomes a crossing. You continue. Any terminal point becomes a cusp. But then, in the end, you have to close it with a compatible global labeling. This is the difficulty. So, and uh, we, our proof uh, produce one solution, but maybe it's not the best and uh, necessarily the best that the, the brain, the human brain, does. Okay. So the scope of this theorem uh, is just to show that uh, the hypotheses are sharp and we are we are able to construct at least one completion. Examples. So suppose that I give to the program just these two curves here. Then the visible contour, this is the visible contour and, and not oriented. Huh? Then uh, the, what, what is the answer of the program visible contour insufficient orienting information because the internal circle cannot be implicitly oriented because it can be oriented in both in, in two. The, the, this orientation is trivial, it's just like this. But this could be in, in two ways, and, uh, and so the program cannot go on. Okay. Second case, suppose that I give you the, the same visible contour, but now I, I, I add the information that this is oriented like this. Okay. Now, the, so the uh, clockwise orientation of the internal circle. And now, suppose that uh, the, 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 the background is just only here, not here. So we impose f equals 0 only in the exterior region. The resulting reconstruction cannot be a torus, because this is not a hole now. It's not a hole. So what is the solution of the program? OK, the solution of the program is the following. The program adds a new circle, and the unique solution of that uh, is this. Uh, what is this? Uh, is a visible torus, the bold one, and there is a sphere behind. OK? So this is uh, the, what uh, the program is producing, intermediate sphere behind. Another st st same visible part, uh, and now you force f equals 0 also here, and uh, the visible contour, visible contour reconstructed torus, seen from above, OK, the, dumb, the, the torus. Again, same visible contour. Now uh, let, let us uh, uh, orient this on the left. So if I orient this on the left, it means that f must be higher here. So this cannot be a hole, cannot be 0. f is 0 only here. So uh, visible construct, co contour reconstruct uh, the apparent contour. So there are no hidden arcs, as in example 2. But this is just uh, a small sphere in front of a big sphere. This is what uh, the, uh, the program gives to you, just only from this information. Now, uh, more interesting maybe now, I suppose that I give to the program this visible contour here. And suppose that is in, in this region. I, I force this to, to have 0 f, so it's supposed to be inside the background, this small e in the region here. So this is what uh, visible contour produces, which is exactly 
our theoretical proof of the completion theorem. When we, do, we imagine a Morse line, we, we, our proof produces exactly this object. Now, as I said, this is not the most natural object that one, uh, one could imagine. This is just one solution, but what is this? You see, this uh, terminal point is becoming a cusp and the completion, this is becoming a, a crossing like this, and then everything goes down, and then you have to close it and put a consistent labeling. Is this possible? Yes, because this is a theorem, okay? And uh, what is this? Now, the program is able to tell you what is this. This is not clear. I mean, maybe it's clear, it's a torus, but the program is, is telling to, to, to you that after, uh, after some command that you give, you simplify it with a list of moves that I will explain at the end, and what the program gives to you is the torus. Okay, so uh, this is, maybe we are a little bit happy about this. Uh, now, suppose that you, you don't force f to be zero here. Now, what is the solution? So you remove the marking of the small internal region as part of the background. So the background is only this one. You enforce your program, visible contour. Our proof theoretically is this one. It's a very complicated completion where in the small circle there is an f and the other labeling are, are the d. This is what we find in our proof. This is what visible contour is doing. And what is this? This is not clear at all. This must be simplified with the use of the moves. And uh, visible contour, after using the moves that I will explain in a minute, uh, simplify it. Uh, uh, the formal 3D sphere, for instance, using the elementary moves. So this is actually is the apparent contour of a sphere. <laughs> okay? Using the elementary moves that I will explain. So the above example show that it may be difficult to recognize your 3D shape. The topology of what is this is, is not clear. So it is necessary to find moves that simplify the apparent contours uh, remaining inside the equivalent shapes, ambient isotopic shapes. So this is a this is one of the, ba the main problems in knot theory, of course. And in, in, the, in that case, uh, these moves are three C, uh, elementary moves and are called Reidemeister moves. So uh, here also there are uh, essentially six uh, uh, elementary moves. Uh, this situation is more rich, uh, is a little bit more complicated than knot theory. And uh, these uh, moves have been implemented in, uh, in this uh, up contour. So there is a theorem here but, but that for me maybe is one of the most difficult uh, that says that two 3D shapes are equivalent if and only if you can pass from one apparent contour of the first one to the, second, to the apparent contour of the second one only through a finite number of elementary moves, like in knot theory exactly. And uh, uh, which kind of moves are, are, are these? Okay, these, uh, these are essentially six moves. There is, uh, this, uh, this is called the T move. Locally, you, you, allow, you are allowed to do this. This is uh, the, uh, correspond to the third move of Rademaster. Then there are new moves. Uh, this is, uh, this collapse to cusps, and also this collapse to cusps. So this is called leap and big to big. This is, uh, uh, Cusp, um, swallow tail is this one. This collapse uh, two cusps and destroy this swallow tail, the inverse. Uh, okay, th th there are also this one. And then the other, this uh, K type, K1, K0, K1B, K, K2, K1, etc. Uh, these are locally the move of type K. But essentially, these are um, the theorem as before says that these are only. Uh, the, the all the, this set of moves is complete. So these are enough to, uh, to describe uh, isotopic uh, surface um, shapes in 3D. These kind of moves on uh, two uh, planar graphs. Okay? So th this kind of, uh, okay, these are realizations in 3D uh, taken from a paper uh, of, uh, of these authors uh, in 2006. Uh, 
with, uh, with, which shows uh, a sort of a physical realization of the moves. Okay, this is. Uh, I found this nice, so I reproduce it. This is the reference. So now the proof of that theorem is, for me, is quite uh, complicated, but it is based on classical and very important basic results of Whitney, Tom, Arnold, and others on singularity theory. Okay, uh, the program up contour can manipulate these moves. And, and can, in order to, to simplify and possibly recognize the object, okay? For instance, uh, there is a rule, an action rule, uh, which if, if you ask this, the, the computer uh, tell you which kind of, I, I can apply this move, this move, and this move here, here, and here. What do you want that they do? Start from here, and then he tries to, to go on, okay? Um, for instance, uh, what the computer is doing, if you, if you give the computer this object, you apply moves K1B, so it is possible to push this part inside, keeping the two, the two cusps, and then there is a leap move which collapses the cusps together, and you, you come here, so this is a sphere. Okay? Okay, now, uh, if you think of a torus, if you, if you look of a torus obliquely, just uh, two minutes, maybe. If you look, uh, yes, if you look uh, from it of a torus, you look at torus uh, obliquely, you see uh, four cusps. But if you look uh, of a torus from above, for instance, you don't see any cusps. You just see two circles, one inside the other, with the proper orientation. Now, essentially, this is interesting to say it, it, also, it is always the case. So it says that if you have a smooth closed surface embedded in a tree, you can find a set of moves transforming it in such a way that the apparent contour has no cusps, like for the torus. So maybe you increase a lot the number of, of crossings, but at least you can destroy all cusps. This is a general theorem again. These are all in your book? Yes, everything is there. Yes, yes, yes. So final remarks, sorry for the delay. Um, we are now uh, sta start trying to understand a little bit better some uh, other kind of uh, uh, invariants of 3D shapes. Uh, these are shapes more complicated than knots and links, uh, so it's not so clear for us. We are trying to, to work on this, but we are going to three-dimensional topology, and I am not an expert really on that. Uh, so what I've said uh, up to now does not include cubes, for instance. So, uh, for instance, polyhedral uh, Lipschitz objects. We have plenty of uh, non-smooth objects in here in this room, and uh, the theory does not include that, unfortunately. There is a new, a new singularity, Y-junction, in that case. And uh, what about uh, uh, the discussion was concerned with the embedded surface? What about immersed sur manifold, or even less than immersed, uh, with um, not even immersed with the singular point, uh, the differential not of maximal rank, etc. Uh, there is a lot of literature on that. Maybe everything has been done. So I just, there are, these are just few names on, on that. Okay, that's it. Sorry for the delay. Thank you. Thank you.